what is Friday your favorite PM personality profile is here again my guest tonight he's a journalist former director of the Ghana Institute of Journalism former president of the Ghana Journalists Association he is a former chairman of the National Media Commission former ambassador to Cote d'Ivoire and former High Commissioner to Sierra Leone, Ambassador Cabral Blay Amir. Good to see you. Uh, good to have you, Aisha. It's been a while. How have you been? We're surviving mm, in, this, in these COVID times. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. And, and what have you been up to all this while? Well, uh, I've been spending uh, the last few years uh, doing a couple of things. Um, uh, I was the chairman of the Gridco, that's the national grid company for the last three years. So that kept me occupied, uh, as it were, from being a journalist, a media person, to uh, dealing with energy problems. And then uh, what has also occupied my time has been the Council on Foreign Relations, Ghana, a think tank uh, devoted to foreign affairs and international aff uh, policy, of which I'm the vice president. So this, these two items keep me busy, and I, I also try to spend my time writing. Interesting. But of course, we've all admired you um, from afar, I mean, for all the good works you've been doing over the years. Let's talk about your name, Cabral, because a number of your, your mates or those you grew up with say they know you to be Peter. <laughs> Where from Cabral? <laughs> Who told you I'm called Peter? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, they are right. As a matter of fact, right from primary school all the way to the university, uh, my name was Peter Blay Amihir. Okay. And these are the names on my O-level, A-level, and first degree certificates. Okay. Uh, but now it is officially Cabra Blay Ami here. What happened? And at way back January 20th, 1973, if I'm right, that's when the, the leader of the movement for liberation in Guinea-Bissau, Amika Cabra, was uh, assassinated. I was there in the first year in the university. And I got involved in uh, all the activities to highlight um, the, the wicked uh, act of the imperial powers. And uh, so for a first year to have been that involved, everybody started calling me Cabra. <laughs> and I thought it was uh, a fine name. Uh, it was a more uh, romantic name, if you want to put it that way, <laughs> than Peter. Everybody is called Peter. So I, 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 I took Cabra is my name. Mm. It was C, but I changed it to K to Africanize it. To Africanize yeah, it. So that's how I, I got to be called Cabra. But, but the Amir also, because I know that Blay is supposed to be the surname. Well, I have uh, like many Ghanaians who want to tell a story with their names. You hyphenate it. So Blay is the name of my biological father. And Amir is the name of the father who looked after me from primary school to secondary school. Okay. So when I was in primary school, I was called Kwabna Peter Kwabna Mihie. Then I got to know that my father was Blay. Okay. And I had uh, siblings uh, called Blay, like the famous boxer Eddie Blay. Mm. So I thought, why don't you also uh, play on the Blay? But I, I didn't want to forget my. The father who looked after me. Okay, so he was actually what your stepfather. Yeah, well, I wouldn't call my stepfather. He was my, you know, my ma my my mother uh, married him after okay. my father divorced my mother Great. as a as a small as a baby more or less. Okay. So I said that this guy has been good to you. So you make sure that uh, his that name thing. becomes part of your story. So that's why I'm Blay. I'm here. Blay for the biology of my birth, and I'm here for the <laughs> actual parenting. So, but the Peter you don't want anymore. Well, uh, I used to be even called Peter Lawrence because when you also uh, confirm as a Catholic, you take another name. Okay. But you know, these are days that you should you should go back to your roots. Mm. So I I prefer Cabra, and he's been with me for the last forty years, and 
it's easier to pronounce and uh, it it opens doors i'm sure if you wanted to write peter lawrence kwabana Cabra, Cabra, Cabral, uh, Blay, I mean, I mean, that will be it's a, a mouthful. A mouthful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you were born in the Western region. Yes. Where to be precise? Well, uh, I'm told I was born in a, a village called Baku. Okay. Not the Baku in Azerbaijan. Mm. Uh, <laughs> in the Western region. Uh, Is it so a that's small what, village? Yeah, a small that's village. It's very popular. close to the to the the now gas capital of Ghana. Uh, at Tuambo. Tuambo yeah, but my, my, my parents, my, my mother uh, lived in Ikwe, so I describe Ikwe as my hometown. Okay. But my place of birth is, is Baku. Okay. Yeah. So you are an Inzima? Yes. Both parents? Uh, both parents are from the Western region and from that part of Ghana. Okay, so how, how do you say, how are you? You taught me a while ago, but well, I forgot. You it. say Kodie. Kodie. And you say Bete. Bete means yeah. I, I'm doing well. Yes, yes. Yeah, but, I, but just to add up to your question, you know, I was born in Baku, but I think when I was about two, three, I found myself in Sebekwai, where my mother had remarried. Okay. So I grew up in Sebekwai, and for, for years, and up to now, I consider myself as a citizen of uh, Sebekwai, because that's where I was I You was grew made. up, okay. Yes, you know, okay. Yeah. So tell me about growing up in Sebekwai. Well, it, it, it was uh, a great place. Uh, those were the days when... We didn't have road networks, uh, we didn't have uh, telephones as we have today, in, uh, internet and the rest. So your best bet was newspapers. And uh, I, I saw myself selling newspapers as, as a small boy, you know, so I'm not surprised I later on became a journalist. Mm. But it, it was a great time, there was great scholarship. Um, the teachers, most of them were people teachers, but they actually encouraged us to, to brighten our corner. Mm, so where you are. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I think I owe a lot to say quiet to the teachers I met there, the friends I met there. Uh, the late uh, Buff Bonnie, mm. uh, who was the founding uh, MD of um, of Gold, was my contemporary at uh, Sehu Bakwai. We grew up together, so I, I knew him very well. Mm. Yeah. Tell me about the story of St. Augustine's. The fact that you nearly missed out, even though you were uh, given admission, but the last ditch plea of your mom got you back into school. <laughs> Who's been talking to you about? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you, you well, I passed the common entrance in Sehibokwai, uh, and by some luck or coincidence, I'm selected to go to um, St. Augustine's. Uh, my, my father, um, the Ami here, somehow they didn't fancy. Uh, secondary education. He thought I should go to a training college. Okay. You know, you could do that those times. Well, and yeah, that was free. Okay. But in secondary school, you have to pay uh, okay. something. You know. mm. And for some strange reason, uh, this father who believed in education you know, was not buying into uh, me going to a secondary school. You know, so he was not paying the admission fees in those days. And my mother, who was not a uh, literate or educated, you know, I don't think he appreciated what it was to get admission to Augustus. Um, I had to beg, plead, uh, get uh, friends to go and talk to her, you know, and she was adamant. I don't think she saw the, the big picture. Uh, somehow, somebody died and they were going to bury the person in Zima. Okay. And uh, at the station, I told her that well, this is my, 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 my chance, so if you don't give the money. So right at the station, he told me that, go to my bedroom, there is something, there is something hiding somewhere. Uh, there will be money inside, uh, take the 10 pounds and go and pay your, because it was a uh, pound sterling, okay. and pay your uh, uh, admission fee. When I went, it was about 20 pounds, so I took about 15 pounds, paid the 10 pounds and, uh, you know, Use the five pounds. No, I, I use it to uh, to celebrate as, as it were with my friends. <laughs> yeah, so that's the how eventually you know. Then my I had a senior brother who, when my mother informed him about my admission, sent my mother back uh, to process my admission. But by that time, I had already been admitted, and uh, I was about to be on my way to Cape Coast. I'm sure it was fun then, being in secondary school. 
Well, uh, it, it could be, it could be, and you know, for me it was a, a different experience. That was the first time I, I saw the sea. Mm. I never seen the sea. I never sat in a, a train, you know. So even the journey to uh, to Augustine Skip was, was great. And I know surprisingly, and uh, maybe this uh, when we are interviewing, is a time to mention it. When I go to Augustine's, the very first night, you were about four, f six boys from Sehigo Kwai. And those were the days when there was homoing. You know homoing? Yes. Right? Green horn. Yeah, the first person to homo <laughs> me was Tony Akuto Ampau. <laughs> the famous the celebrated Ampau. lawyer. He was the, then, then we call him. No, no. I, I mean, I think if I, I mention his name, he would humble me again. <laughs> again. After all these years, so I won't dare. <laughs> you know. Now he says he's called Shishi, but I, he had another name. Tell me about. No, it. no, no. I won't mention it. <laughs> hey, once a senior, I fear him. Always a senior. After all these years, you know. But what is great is that uh, he was the first to humble me. <laughs> of course, uh, we became friends and comrades. What exactly did he do to you? <laughs> oh, he, it was friendly humble me. <laughs> Very friendly, you know. Okay. You are about seven. They was they were, he had a friend called Billy Bones. I can mention his name. Mm. And he had a, a, a more outrageous name. Which was I can't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> I will try with contempt of uh, seniority. You know My goodness. <laughs> so the the joy one that is Oof <laughs> then one will say in a baritone voice, Oof <laughs> Then you have to mention where you came from. And this guy had a, a, a I recall those words, that's three words of the hands. So, you know, he went on like that. So, that's a uh, contemporary for you. So, I'm very great uh, for his uh, mentorship <laughs> and I'm proud of his achievement mm. as a legal person and as a, an activist for human rights. And mm. I think today or yesterday is a day to celebrate him mm. uh, for his performance uh, at the court. So, after the homoing, you became friends? Oh, we, we are the best of friends. We used to play football together at uh, Legon, and uh, uh, I tell him that uh, uh, I could play better than him, but he's, he's a fantastic sports person. Okay. He's an athlete, he plays football, and he's, he's, a, he's a man of all... <laughs> Jack of all yeah, trades. All trades you know, <laughs> yeah. But St. Augustine's must have been fun, because I know your two boys also attended St. Augustine's and I know mm. all the St. Augustine's people I know mm -hmm. they say you must attend I mean you must be an Absunian there must be a reason for that well I, I want to be charitable to to Cape Coast <laughs> and the generals to uh, all the good schools in Cape Coast but I think Cape Coast is a great place to to have a, a second education you know it's, it's a mix of people from all parts of, 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 of the country. Mm. Uh, the boarding system allowed uh, people from all walks of life, uh, backgrounds to, you know, to mingle in that, uh, that, that port. And then being in Cape Coast where you had them fans from Addis Ababa, uh, Ghana National, uh, and the girls' schools, you know, you, you, you mixed outside um, your narrow confines of uh, other Addis school or guest school. But if I want to talk about our grade school, I, I think it's a great school in the sense that uh, the values that the, the school taught us was to, to work hard at, at, uh, at whatever you, you choose to do. Uh, it taught us to be humble. It taught us to have, even to be patriotic, because you know, if you know the history of Ghana's uh, independence, uh, the bulk of students who went onto the streets so, to support Kwame Nkrumah were from Augustine's. Mm. The three of the tutors who lost their jobs for supporting the 1948 routes were from Augustine's. Yeah. So the day you arrive there, you know, you, you, you get this kind of uh, uh, injection of patriotism, you know, and I think uh, I can mention a couple of Augustinians who have served this country very well and they can trace uh, wh wh whatever the service they give to uh, from uh, uh, that school by the beach, mm. the college by the beach. And, and I always hear them say, once of an Absunian, always an Absunian, right? I, I guess so. Tell me about your days in secondary school. Were you a bad boy? No, no, I wasn't. I they wasn't. say you were Itron. Uh, wh what is the meaning of that one? <laughs> <laughs> I um. mean, you were, um, 
a very strong character. You wouldn't allow people to bully you. And well, uh, well, I was homeward by Akutuampa, so <laughs> I wasn't that. Uh, <laughs> that was. Yeah, but I, but I think on on a very serious note, uh, I, I most of the things I do today, uh, I I pick the lessons from Ogesco leadership. From Ogesco, Ogesco, um, I I I was in my time. It was the first time that there was a lessons to choose a school prefect. And uh, I was the favorite of the students. And for some uh, reason that I cannot explain, I was disqualified. Very Why? Sim very simple reason. You know, I'm a born and you know, I was baptized and confirmed Catholic. But when I was in Form 5 and I was filling my forms, you know, you do a bio uh, for your departure. I, where they wrote religion, I wrote a non denominational Christian. Uh, inspired by what Nkuma uh, described himself in his book. So at the interview, I was asked that uh, you are, you say you are not a, a denominational Christian. You are in a Catholic school. Why should they make you the, the school prefect of a Catholic school? Mm. And I said, uh, well, um, I did write, you know, I, w I was caught because uh, the, the, the evidence was there. Yep. So I said, well, I agree that I wrote that. But uh, the Catholic doctrine also says that once a Catholic, always a Catholic. So you can ask the, the Reverend uh, <laughs> Father, who was part of the interview panel. Then he said, I don't bring me in. <laughs> so that was the way I, you I was shocked. So I was disqualified. And for three days, uh, there was a boycott of classes. Oh, uh, because I had the support of the students, you know. But after three days, I told my guys that uh, there'll be another day, so they should go. They should for, forget it, and then um, I'll find something to do. So I became the secretary of the student council, where I was able to make an impact. So right from Ogesco, school, I discovered that you don't have to be an office holder to make an impact. You can always write in the corner. Hmm. So beyond that, I even established a, a current affairs club. Uh, in the school, in the school, you know, and uh, made myself the president. So <laughs> they took one push for you me. You needed I to be something at all costs. You know, so <laughs> it, you can always do some. But so, Ogesco school was a good training ground for me. That's where I, I was editor of the school magazine, and so I, I learned my journalism uh, from Ogesco school. From Ogesco school, and I, and I also believe that um, my love for reading, for writing, was developed at Ogesco school. We had a some brothers from the Holy Cross uh, from the U.S. They brought a lot of books. Mm. So between myself and uh, a, a friend, uh, Professor Poku Ajiman, who was at Cape Coast University, a mm. lecturer of English, yeah. we used to read about 30 books a term. Wow. You know, so we were doing all the academic stuff, but we found time to, to, to read. And I'm not surprised he became a, a lecturer in English and one of the best uh, in the country. But what were you reading in St. Augustine? Oh, everything. You know, I was reading... Uh, <laughs> no, I uh, mean, um, what courses did Oh, I did, did, a, I did arts. You did uh, general arts? Yes, I did arts. Literature, uh, history... No, I didn't do literature, but I did Latin. Okay. You know, Latin. You did Latin. And, and uh, you said I was going through my, my stuff. Oh, no, a friend in London uh, who I stayed with uh, was going through his stuff and he saw a book uh, that I won as a prize, you know, for the, being the best in Latin in Form 5. Mm. So Latin was a favorite. I did Greek, I did Latin. Okay. Those were the days when we did classics. Mm. So, um. so right from even secondary school, you knew you were heading towards journalism? Well, I, I wouldn't say so, but I knew whatever I did in life, I would have to uh, give to uh, my uh, community, my mm. society. Mm. So being editor of a uh, school magazine was, you know, trying to and of course, it's when I came to Legon, I was I became the editor of the the newspaper for the the magazine for the the student uh, council, the forum. Yeah. Um, so it just uh, followed from what I I started at Augusto. So from St Augustine's to where? To Legon. To Legon. Yeah. So you you did secondary school, but you didn't do upper six or. I did all the seven years in, in our time. In St Augustine's. Yes, yeah. Wow. When I return from the break, we'll be talking about his days at the University of Ghana and his leadership, the leadership positions that he occupied around that time. Again, he became director of the Ghana Institute of Journalism at a very young age. 
he will share his experience with us and also tell us about his football passion. Stay with me, I'm coming right back. Welcome back to PM Personality Pro for my guest tonight, Ambassador Cabral Blay Amihel, and we're having some fantastic conversation about his growing up. Now, um, from St. Augustine's, you went to University of Ghana. Yeah. Tell me about it. I'm sure it's a bag of experience. Well, <laughs> uh, Legon was, uh, was wild in terms of what it offered in those days. And uh, I, I, I arrived at Legon at the right time. Um, I, in fact, I got there the same day with my cousin, uh, Freddie Blay. Yeah. Uh, he went to the same hall, so at least there was that kind of bonding. Uh, but within a few months, we made friends all over. And I was in the, in the annex of a Kwafu Hall, and we all ate at the cafeteria. You know, so uh, that meant that at the cafeteria, there were about six of the annexes who ate there. And then we used to hang out at the, there was a cafeteria bar, you know. So if you want to do politics, as I ended up doing, it, it was a, a big plus because mm. you, you build a network. Okay. And if you had a name like Cabra, uh, it was easy to pronounce and it, you know, so it opened doors, as I said earlier on. But you got at the right time, I'm seeing that because there was a lot of intellectual uh, exchanges going on. We had uh, lecturers like Tachuti Kata, uh, Kusibuichwe, Professor Akela Pasoya, uh, who were more on the left. And then we had uh, others like uh, uh, Fulson, Adalamoti, who were on the right. So Legon was, a, was a, a boiling point for ideas, you know. So no matter what course you studied, uh, at the various lectures that were organized at the auditorium. You, you learn outside your main uh, course. Uh, Dr. Chambers was, was there, uh, Professor Techue Menu. Mm. I, I can mention them. And these are all uh, great minds who went on to play uh, major roles in Ghana's uh, in history. Uh, Ambassador Dike Ose uh, was there. Um, he be, so I got to know him through there, and uh, since then our, our friendship has blossomed. And, uh, we do things together. I mean, the Council on Foreign Relations, mm. uh, it's, it's something that we are, we are doing together. So Legon was a great place to be mm. uh, when, I, when I got there. It was at Legon that I met Kofi Ganaba, okay. uh, who took to me because uh, uh, my name was uh, Cabra, and uh, he was also excited that you know, I had that name. So it was a place to meet people. I met the Prime Minister of uh, Guinea-Bissau, Aristela Pereira, and the Foreign Minister, Luis Cabra. Uh, whilst at Legon and many other other people, but on, on the whole, it was a great place to be in the 70s. Uh, we had all the fun, but we, we also exchanged ideas, very vigorous uh, debate. Um, and we got involved in national politics, you know, the Unigov uh, uh, concept was around our time, and along the line, I, I also uh, got elected when I, I, I was doing my postgraduate as a NUCS president, mm. you know, so uh, it, was a, it was a great time being in Legon. We, were, we had great mentors. Uh, the late Art Austin, for instance, was, was somebody that uh, was, was, was uh, great to know because he was full of ideas, we, you know, and if you mix with people ideas, you, something rubs on you. Mm. So what did you read in, at the University of Ghana? I did history and sociology. Okay. And at the University of Ghana, at a point you wanted to, you became a NUCS president, right? Yes, absolutely. How did, you, I mean, what happened? You, you had to leave that position. Well, you know, I, I, uh, the background is that um, uh, Freddie Blay, Chairman Blay, as he's now known. Who is your cousin? Yeah, was the SRC president. Okay, so it was a family affair, right? Uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. <laughs> that, that concern had not arrived in Ghana at that time. <laughs> Uh, as it may be, he was the president of the SRC uh, whose administration had to organize uh, the, the, the NUCS presidency. You know, at that time, um, the NUCS presidency was shared among the three universities, Legon, K 
Cape Coast and uh, Kumasi. Okay. So they will have elections. It, it rotated. So when, once it comes to Legon, so when I go to Legon in 76 for my post grad, it was the turn of Legon. So I got elected. Uh, Freddie Blay organized the, the, the elections. Not him personally, but you know, it was on his watch. He was in charge, yes. And uh, I, I, I won massively. I won. I beat um, my opening was from Commonwealth Hall, which is a very competitive uh, hall. But I had an advantage being mm. the Akuafu uh, Hall and being a, a member of the annex, so I won easily. Okay. Uh, and I think for the, for some reasons, people couldn't understand why you know two blaze will be in, in, in at the helm of affairs. Okay. Uh, so there were other factors, but then uh, an agitation started, you know, to get rid of us. Um, my, my goodness. Yeah, so... Just because of your surname? Well, I believe that, first of all, you know, they couldn't understand uh, a blade to a blade, you know. Yeah. Blade was SRC president and then... So they were suspecting some conflict no, there of was, interest? No, it, it was but one free and fair. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no pardon, nothing <laughs> like that. Uh, you know, so we won free and fair. But I think they could understand. There were other factors. I mean, uh, uh, it's a long story. Uh, for instance, one of the... Uh, so at one point, you know, they, they managed a day to uh, for the Blaise uh, exit as president. They voted him out. My God. Yes, you know. It that was, must have been painful. <laughs> well, you know, I don't think the grounds were solid, but, but they, they were resolved too, you know. So they, they, they had their mind. So after approaching the Blaise, as they call it, that you shall put them like cassava. <laughs> Uh, so blade gone, one blade gone, the second SRC blade. blade gone. Yeah, so for me, they brought 13 charges. <laughs> Which were? <laughs> one of the charges uh, was that there was, uh, you know, uh, some students had been uh, rusticated in, uh, in uh, Zambia. And at the, at the time that Kamunda was visiting Ghana, some students had been also been uh, rusticated. Okay. So they said that you should demonstrate against... Uh, um, Kaunda. Kaunda for for the rustication of students in um, in Zambia, you know, and uh, uh, somehow I wasn't convinced, and uh, we didn't do it under my leadership. So that was a charge against me. But I was <laughs> arguing that we have not demonstrated against our own rusticated students. So why do you do? You know, it's like a diffusion uh, philosophy type of thing. You know, so uh, they, 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 so it was a charge. One of the charges was that, uh, you know, which is uh, that um, somehow, you know, in our rounds, whatever you were going, there was a lady, uh, they claim was my friend, who was always uh, Following in you. the entourage. <laughs> but that lady was in the entourage because she was an office holder. Okay. You know, so they were, you know, I but can't they were reading all sort of meaning. Yeah, you know, when they want so to right. control you, they have to get charges. <laughs> So we went to Kumasi uh, <laughs> for a final meeting. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, John Debugri, they were all there. Mm -hmm. uh, I won. You know, okay. they brought the charges. I answered the charges. I won. And then uh, somehow my advisors, there was a trip to Moscow, you know, okay. to Cuba. Okay. So my advisors said that we you know to assert our victory. Uh, I should uh, undertake that trip. In fact, I didn't know about the trip. It so the arrangement for the trip took just about 48 hours. To do. You know, so when I was away, I was on my way to Havana. And then I was in Moscow when I was told that I have been overthrown. <laughs> like Kwame <laughs> Kwame, <when laughs> he was on his way to uh, uh, Hanoi when he got to Beijing, you know. So, so that was my story. So I returned from uh, Havana, uh, deposed. You? <laughs> I went as president, I came back deposed, you know. Uh, but my goodness and out of that student politics yeah, out of that i learned a lot i'm, I'm told that i i know don petro also suffered the same feat he was also my god you know, but <laughs> but it, it was good you know see you, you should miss all the adversities in your life very early mm. it taught me a lot so out of the lessons learned uh, i i told myself that if i get any chance to serve anywhere i'll make sure that i don't suffer the same feat and that means taking all the best decisions. That means that you build good consequences. And that means that you, you get everybody on board. Yep. Because when they eventually met to 
uh, vote me out. Some of my my guys, th those who had been supporting me, those who voted for me, <laughs> you know, I won eight seven. So the some of the eight uh, drifted because they were not kept in the know. Aww. So I learned that if you're a leader, carry everybody along. If mm. I'd informed them about my trip, you yeah. know. You know, so I learned a lot and it made me a better person. Mm. You know, mm. and it made me also very independent and much of a low ranger. Okay. Where I do things out of convention uh, without looking at what others would do with me or for me. Okay. Uh, I make the best of, of my, my vision mm. and my commitment. And mm. I think that wherever I have been after uh, the Nukes experience, uh, DJ, uh, the West African Journalists Association, the International Federation of Journalists. Uh, I make the best out of, of, of the moment. And I'm sure you made the best when you took charge of affairs at the Ghana uh, uh, Institute of Journalism. I'll come to that, but I want to find out how you transitioned into journalism. How did it happen? Well, so I'm at Legon, and uh, of all the courses, you know, first of all, I find myself editing the student magazine. In, at the university, the university. too. Okay. I finished and then uh, they had opened the School of Journalism at Legon and I decided to do the postgraduate when I could have done other things, you know. At that time, the, the most attractive thing to do was law. Uh, so I could have opted, you know. But I, I took that. After my service, I did teaching for my service, history, in the Bronga Half region. After the service, I finished service on the 30th June, July 1st, I, I was working at Ghanaian Times as a features uh, writer. Wow, I do that's two, quick. I do two years there, and for reasons uh, that I thought was uh, a threat to my existence. I was too young, so I was naive. Mm. And when I look back, I have stayed, but God has a purpose for, for us. Yeah. So after two years, I left. I was in the wilderness, <laughs> work with a people called the Statesman. Yeah. Uh, and then I ended up GIJ in 79. Mm. Uh, two years later, there's a coup d'etat, and the, the principal or the, the head, no, this principal, is uh, sacked for some uh, financial reasons. And I think when they look at the people there, I, w I, I then started writing for, for the Spectator as a columnist, and I was the, about the only columnist not too many of us, about two, three. Okay. I was well read, uh, uh, so people knew me. Yeah. I, I had won a journalist of the year in 1981, UAC, you know, mm. and that's another story. Mm. So when they look at the poor at GIG, I think that I fitted the bill. Uh, my friend at Watson was the uh, Minister of Information, Secretary of Information, and my credentials uh, and my fame was established. So uh, I got a nod to be the director. Okay. And uh, I became acting director for two years, I believe. And okay. then uh, move on to go to Paris to broaden my horizon. Okay. And when I came back, uh, the job was gone, so I had to do other things. Mm. Yeah. How, how was journalism in those days? Well, you know, you are talking about 79, you know, first of all, when I joined the Guinean Times in 76, there was a military rule. We didn't have uh, too many private, no, there, was, there were only about two private newspapers. The dominant media was the state-owned media. They were under control of the, the powers that be. Mm -hmm. Editors could be appointed and sacked at the whim or the fiat of the, of the Minister of Information or the Secretary of Information. Mm -hmm. um, uh, journalists work under fear, you know, then there is the, the transition to civilian rule on the Liman for two years. Uh, at that period, you know, uh, we had a taste of freedom. So you could do whatever you wanted to do, even then. Then uh, there was a reversal, 81, then from 82 to 92, it was the period of culture of silence. Mm. Uh, and that is not, was not the best of time to be a, a, a media journalist. person. Mm. I mean, today, if you go to any of the schools of journalism, if you go to GIG, there are about over a thousand people who are doing various aspects of communication studies. Yeah. Uh, almost all the private universities are establishing 
schools of journalism, there are a lot of mushroom schools. Mm. Uh, there are so many newspapers, uh, radio stations, you know, so now there's no fear about being uh, penalized, being uh, arrested, being uh, losing your life, you know. Mm. So those were difficult times, dangerous mm -hmm. times. So it was, it was a dark chapter to be a journalist. Mm. Today, there's a light. Mm. There are windows, there are opportunities. Uh, nobody harasses a journalist. And if, you're, if they are, you are harassed, you can resort to the courts, you can resort to, I mean, we have habeas corpus, you can't be kept in for more than 48 uh, hours. So they are, there's a lot of protection for the media of today. Mm. When you finally became the director of GIJ, yeah. you were very young. Tell me about the experience. And at some point, you had to leave once again. Yeah. Tell me the story behind it. Well, no, by the time I, I go to GIJ, young as I might have been, I had learned my lessons from uh, my Nukes experience, from my Times experience. So I, w I moved in there uh, with a clear vision as to what had to be done and with a clear strategy as to how to achieve my goal. So I brought everybody on board, the workers, uh, the staff, and uh, I had ideas as to what uh, the training of journalists should be like. Mm. Um, you know, this is a, a profession that is a combination of the vocational skills and the intellectual uh, 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 dimension. And, and I believe that the best journalist is the one who is strong in uh, social studies or the sciences or in a, a, academic, uh, academic scholarship. Mm. And then the vocational skills becomes secondary because uh, there are stories of journalists who reach the heights, who didn't necessarily uh, have formal training in journalism. They learned on a job. So I decided when I look at the, the course content of GIG, I thought they, there was a need for a change. So I introduced a couple of subjects that would deepen the intellectual groundings of the students. So I brought a course like African Political Thought, uh, Political Economy, and uh, of course we also did history. And I think I even emphasized advertising uh, because at that time, you know, you, you were, you know, look at the times. It was in the context of the of the the revolution, you know. And if you know socialist theory of media, advertising then. They didn't play that major role of uh, uh, marketing capitalist goods, you know. Uh, so we de-emphasize it. Uh, so the so the the point is, of course, there was some critique of that uh, major policy, but the whole vision was to make sure that those who came out of GIG, it was a two-year program at that time, were deeply grounded in theory and and practice. And I think by, by injecting that aspect of the, into the training, I was building on the, on the dreams of the, of the founding fathers. That's uh, when Nkoma set up GIG, it was to train journalists to be involved in the, in the, in the struggle for African liberation and unification of Africa. Mm. You know, so I thought I was building on that foundation, which had been lost along the line. So we did a lot of things. I even redesigned the, the certificate. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I'm biased towards uh, Bob Marley. Uh, so <laughs> Why? Well, you know, Bob Marley, you know, he doesn't only sing about love and uh, fun. He, he talks about liberation, yeah. emancipate your mind, liberate yeah. Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. uh, unite Africa. You know, mm -hmm. so the colors of the certificate at that time were, were, were bordered with the red, gold, green, which is the Ghana color, yeah. or Ghana colors, yes. and the Rastafarian colors, you know. <laughs> So, so we did things, anyway, but I did it with uh, everybody. <laughs> so what I did stop for some time, we came out with a, a school newspaper called mm. a Combat. Okay. You know, to train journalism. If you are doing uh, journalism training. You must have a feel yeah. of it. So it was called a Combat. And the choice of the name, you know, was also a reflection of what we thought we were fighting for. Okay. You, you are combating prejudice, you are combating uh, poverty, you are combating uh, disease, uh, the system of... Uh, injustice you know so the name was combat and that newspaper trained a couple of uh, journalists who found themselves in the major newspapers mm. after six months of work, uh, working on the paper
And how did you um, leave as a director of GIG? Well, I was, t I was, I was still a young man when I was director. So I was leave for, for other uh, frontiers to travel. Mm. The very year I, I got appointed as the director, I'd be, I've served there for two years as a lecturer. Mm. Then I get appointed as acting director. And that very year I had applied to go on a program in Paris called Journalists in Europe. Uh, it's a fantastic program. Mm. I was admitted, uh, but I didn't want to walk away from the responsibility. So I wrote for uh, a postponement or a deferment. So the, the second year, I thought I should go. Because okay. you know, I, I, I thought it was a good chance. Mm. And I'm happy I did. Mm. Uh, so I took uh, the opportunity and left. Uh, so I left it as acting director, which was not a substantive position. Uh, in my absence, they appointed somebody as acting. Then they removed him and brought somebody else. Uh, when I, by the time I came, you know, uh, I returned a year later. I, I think that um, the powers that be had changed their minds about me being the acting. So they, they confirmed the, the guy who was acting in my place. Uh, and instead, they offered me a job at the castle, information bureau. Uh, but I, I turned it down. Mm. And uh, they also asked me to go and work at the Museum of Information. I turned it down. And they took another part, uh, which saw me editing the free press for about two years. Uh, in very difficult times. You, you made mention that, mm -hmm. um, I mean, your journey to becoming the journalist of the year yeah. were characterized by some circumstances. You, you want to share with us? Well, you see, uh, in those times, there were two award schemes in Ghana. One was organized by the Okuapemai, mm -hmm. and then one was organized by UAC, now Unilever. Okay. And I was then uh, uh, teaching at GIG. So I told my students that I will win this year. Mm. And uh, it came to pass that I won in 1981. Great uh, fanfare. Then the, you know, the, the, the prize for winning was that they would send you to uh, England, in the UK, for uh, two weeks attachment. So I was, I was uh, they organized a, a big function at the, um, their headquarters. And then they gave me my ticket and uh, the, as it were the prize. As part of the prize. Then they asked me, as it's normal, to give my acceptance speech. Speech. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was young. I was young and uh, a radical of a sort. So instead of going on, on my knees and thanking them, <laughs> You went attacking them. I, I said that, uh, well, I, I thank you for the award. <laughs> and uh, I, I want to use the, this occasion to talk about the things that uh, I write about. I write about poverty, about uh, exploitation, about injustice. And in my research as to why the, the, we suffer all these uh, minuses, injustice, poverty, inequality, I find the, the big hand of multinationals behind it. <laughs> and that didn't go so well. So rephrasing what Liman, the president had that time had, had said in a speech, which I, I paraphrased, that they should change their language of profit into a language <laughs> of humanity. When I said it, I could My see goodness. I could see that, you know, the, most of the poor were black, but even in the night you could see that they were all blushing. <laughs> Not a red though. Pink and uh, yellow. <laughs> Everybody was quiet. They, they did the issue of uh, Ghanaian things so over well there. So I went home. <laughs> the next day, a very fine gentleman who was the PR manager. It's, it's, it's called Moses Dovlu. Very nice gentleman. He calls me. He says, I want to see you. He comes to GIJ. He says that uh, we need to reconfirm your ticket. Wow. So if you can let us have a ticket, I'll give it to you. They had taken a decision on you. Then, <laughs> a, a few days later, they write to me that because of the, you know, you see, there had been a revolution, 81, yep. yes. uh, 82, you know. So there were, there were hardships, for instance, uh, shortages. So they, they write to me saying that because of the difficulties with uh, the economy, they, they are rescheduling my 
your travel. Yeah, travel. My yeah. goodness. So when things improve, they would get back to you. <laughs> so I wrote an article in Graphic to say that I'm prepared to wait. That they have been exploiting us for all these years, and if they cannot buy a, a ticket. ticket and fulfill their part of the contract, I'm, if I don't receive my grandchildren, will come, we'll and, come receive. and receive it. So they they sued me for saying that. Yes, and I also sued them. <laughs> you know, meanwhile, <laughs> as a result of what I did, they were still advertising for the next. Uh, edition. Yeah. And my colleague journalists were applying. So I told them that you guys are joking. Until they, they fulfill my my going, nobody will go. <laughs> so that thing was suspended. And in Nigeria, they had, they were going to introduce the same scheme in Nigeria. The Nigerian journalists pointed to my experience and said that we don't want it here. So it mm -hmm. never happened in Nigeria. Wow. So we went to court and uh, Along the line, the lawyer for UAC uh, became a friend because I was editing a free press and they had uh, detained his friend who was the publisher, Tommy Thompson. Mm. So he got to know my, my, me very well and see that they, you know, I, I mean well. So uh, there was a settlement of a sort. So they would do their case and uh, that was the end. But uh, ironically, and it, uh, fast forward 1994, I'm the very person who went and renegotiated for Unilever to get back to supporting the GG journalist of the year. Wow. You know, so you move in the cycle, you make mistakes, uh, you learn, and then you, you, you saw. But I, I, mean, I was right to, to make the stance I made. Mm. You know. And of course, it yielded. I'm not sure today I'll, I'll do it the same <laughs> way. Uh, yeah. So at that time, you were a bit radical. Well, <laughs> uh, you have to, when you are that young, you have to be radical. <laughs> but even now, I might do it. Yeah. I might do it, you know. <laughs> you, I mean, once a soldier, always a soldier, uh, right? I think so, you know. You may look at <laughs> some of the embers, but somehow. <laughs> Ambassador Cabral Blair Mihero uh, is my guest tonight. We've been talking about very interesting stuff. And he's been sharing his experience in journalism with me when i returned from this break he became gja president in fact he he had that position for not once he also became the chairman of the national media commission he will be sharing his experience on that one as well and also talk about his passion for music he has a particular dance it's from the western region don't forget he's from the western region he'll be sharing all of that with us when I return from the break. Stay with me, I'm coming right back. Welcome back to PM Personality Profile and I've been talking to Ambassador Blake Cabral Amir. He's been sharing some wonderful moments with us. Let me start with your experience as GJA president and then all the way to become the chairman of the National Media Commission. How was it like? Well, you know, uh, when you belong to a profession, you have to take an active part. So right in the 70s, when I joined Ghanaian Times and throughout my time in the media, I was active. Uh, in 85, I, I contested for the general secretaryship. And because of my involvement, I went on a post. Okay. Um, then in 93, I contested as the, the president and they beat my two strong uh, opponents almost by a landslide. Wow. Uh, and so... Um, and who were your opponents then? Uh, the late Siracolache and Mr. Isaac Freeze Andor. Yeah. And in those days, those in the state of media dominated the association. Mm. So I was in the private sector. But you still But won. I have built my network uh, from GIG. Most of the students are graphic times were my products. Okay. And uh, we played soccer together in the Media 11, which I helped to establish. You know, so I had a strong uh, foundations and uh, uh, I beat them hands down. Wow. Uh, and for me, beating them was not the issue. Uh, winning was an opportunity to transform the GJ into what I saw should be a, 
an independent body. And I, and I believe that the architecture of the GJ you see today is what we built. Uh, together with uh, a strong team, including uh, Giftia Feni Daze, who succeeded me. Uh, um, a couple of them, uh, uh, Amate, Eleanor Amano, Eunice uh, Bonsu, George Saki, and I had a strong team of uh, non-elected people, Gerard Minsan, Peter Agbeko, um, Matthias Thibault, uh, Pedro Pine, and Matthew Makwabi. And I think that we built a strong architecture foundation. For instance, the awards Scheme. team was, was uh, uh, without humility, was my Your baby. My baby. We started in 85. 86, 87, I had to uh, travel to the UK to study. When I traveled, the PNDC government took over. So for about eight years, up to 92, they were organizing it. And you know, no government has business organizing awards for journalists. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's a, an act of compromise. Yes. So when I became the GGA president again in uh, 1994, I took over. Mm. And the rest is what you have uh, today. The press center is something that we started at Mochi Road. And no matter when you're on Mochi Road, you, you must be bound to Mochi <laughs> or the cemetery. Yes. But we relocated to a circle and then close to... GIJ. Uh, 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 no, I, I would say the castle, the uh, seat of power. Okay. So we had a press center which was generously donated to us by uh, President Kufo during mm. his time, mm. uh, which uh, my successor, Giftia Finidaze, ably uh, transformed to what you see uh, today. So uh, that period was, the, I believe, the transformational period of, of the GJ. Mm. Um, do, do you see the GJ today and you are fulfilled? Well, I, I think they are doing well. They have kept a lot of the things that, you know, uh, the foundations so it is intact and nobody can uh, shift the gg outside its uh, core mandate but i believe and i've had occasion to say that there are many things that they can do uh, with an expanded media landscape you know so uh, maybe there's not a full but i'm sure that there's a lot that they can do uh, when they sleep they should ask themselves that what have they added to what they, they inherited. inherited and if they think that they have added a lot then they should sleep well. <laughs> uh, because that's the yardstick for mm. judging yourself as a leader. Mm. What legacy did you leave? Did well, you just glorify in the legacies of others? Okay, let me put this directly. Many journalists feel that the GJA is not doing enough to protect journalists because they are not proactive enough. What's your own position on this one? Well, I think that if you look at the 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 optics you know, when there are issues it comes out like that's what they did but you know the protection of media freedoms does not lie with the gj with or without gj the constitution of ghana is enough material for any w one who wants to be a journalist to defend himself or the profession mm. you may have a gda presidency or executive that may not live up to expectation what are you doing as a, a media? I mean, for instance, if there's an aberration or a threat to the media, how many journalists, presenters, uh, editors would use their, their space to raise the issue and, and uh, be a voice for, for defense? Mm. So uh, I learned, because of my experience, at Free Press, at Free Press, you were loners, me, Kweku Bakwe, and Tom, Tom Thompson. And we learned to cry our own cry. <laughs> so <laughs> so we should all learn yeah, to cry our own Yeah, don't ask anybody cry. to fight for your freedom. <laughs> the country has given you freedom. <laughs> so why do you want uh, a money or transfer <laughs> to, no, no, do let's your own talk about, Let's talk about the National Media Commission, which you were chairman some time ago. Yeah. Um, the people who say it has become a statement issuing in institution rather than what it really has to be how was it during your time and compare it to now are you fulfilled well uh, this is a difficult one for me to answer given that i'm a past uh, chairperson but I, I think that um, the gj today and tomorrow has a clear roadmap 
it is it's been set up to defend the, the NMC. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. the NMC to defend yeah. and protect press freedom. Okay. It is been it's, set it's up. It's actually in the constitution. constitution, chapter twelve. Yes. The powers are enormous to promote responsible journalism. This they can do through regulation and advocacy. So when they issue statement, it is all part of it. Now where I get worried is when issues emerge and they are silent because of bureaucratic uh, loopholes and the rest. But their silence can be, be taken to mean that they are not being up to their, to their rule. So, and I think that with all institutions of state, it is up to the media itself to hold them responsible. If they are not doing their work, hold them responsible. Mm. Because, you know, the tendency is, is for us to trust others to do the, the job for us. We ha you have to be in the vineyard okay. to sow and reap. So my advice to the media is that your institutions have a clear mandate. There will be times that they will uh, backslide. There will, there will be times that they could be compromised. Mm. It is your vigilance that will keep them awake. Mm. What's your own expectation of the NMC? My expectation is that any time there's an assault on the media, no matter the source, they should be the first to signal society to the coming storm. Mm. Sh should we even wait for it to happen? Well, it's eternal vigilance. So safeguards should always be there. For instance, I'll give an example. With this election petition, you know, in the wake of the, of the storm, then there were uh, voices saying that let's be responsible. You should be proactive. Even long before the petition started, that kind of uh, admonition, that kind of uh, advice, that kind of education should have taken place. You don't wait when the storm is getting near for you to, to uh, uh, move out of the storm. Mm. The NMC would always say that they don't have um, the power to sanction. Do you think they should be empowered them more to be able to do what they are supposed to do? Well, it, it, is, it is something that I think is always uh, being discussed. Uh, the spirit and letter of the constitution was not to replace one uh, sanctioning authority with another one. Uh, but even within the current uh, regime or the current constitution framework, it is still possible through other means uh, to, to, to get the media to do the right thing. Training is one. You know, emphasis on professionalism. Um, there are certain uh, CI that they have to come out with. And for instance, in my time, you tried to come out with, a, with an instrument mm. that was not meant to, to you know, to because I have suffered uh, licensing before. I will never be the, a party to any attempt to license or re regulate media with the strict laws that becomes um, uh, a relapse into culture of silence. Okay. But the, within the, the constitution, the NMC can still take certain uh, measures that will regulate the media without being uh, say, uh, a tool of censorship and uh, 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 being punitive against journalists. Mm. Let me gauge your mood on this letter that um, generated a whole lot of discourse from the lawyers of the judicial service warning the media to be mm. circumspect in their language mm. after the, uh, the ruling of the election petition. And the media has responded to it in a, set, um, in a way. Our understanding of that letter um, is that the judiciary is trying to gag the media and yeah. take us back to the culture of silence. And indeed, the G GJA has responded to it. You had the president talk about how mm -hmm. we are not happy about the situation. Well, I, I believe that that uh, advice, if considered out of the context in which under which was released mm. will be uh, uh, in line you know, with saying that we did it in 2013 that these are 
they are, these are dangerous times, these are tempestuous times, so don't uh, add fuel. But if you read the text of the, the letter of the judicial service, it was asking the media to delete. Mm. And my response is that that amounts to attempt to censor the media. Yeah. At best, if you think that there's something that is scandalous or out of what you consider reasonable, you have a right to rejoinder, which is guaranteed by the constitution. Mm. And the courts can even call the, uh, someone the, uh, the persons involved uh, to face contempt. Because the, 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 I don't agree with the, 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 the contempt law as, as uh, couch in the, in the status, mm. but it is still there. But you don't ask the media to delete. In any case, if you are looking for the source of all those uh, um, uh, undesirable things that should be deleted, mm. <laughs> you won't find them on uh, uh, mainstream media. Yes. I mean, you won't find them on Joy. Yeah. Uh, PM Express. No, you won't find it there. You may find it on uh, Facebook on Twitter, on uh, other platforms. So why don't you write to Facebook to delete? <laughs> you know, so I think it was, it was a misstep. <laughs> and they should have, they are, they, are, they are institutions created by the constituent to, to take off arising matters. The best place to address the matter is through the NMC. Yeah. <laughs> so why didn't they, uh, look, in my, in my time, the Chief Justice had a complaint against uh, a media house in her powers or jurisdiction as the CJ, she could have summoned the person before the she complained to the NMC. But interestingly, we've not had the NMC on this one. Well, that is a question that you should ask them. I will not want to uh, speak for them. Hmm. And again, the current president in his time. When he was in opposition, he had a, you know, he's a, he's a, a lot of great standing. He had a case against the session of the media. He came to the NMC, it took a year for the matter to be resolved. Mm. And I can say that for when the President Mahama was, uh, was, the, was the sitting head of, head of state, in matters that he was not comfortable with, he again didn't exercise his power as head of state because he knows that under the constitution, he resorted to the NMC. So, I believe that the, the judicial service could have achieved their goal by just uh, routing their complaint uh, through the NMC. And the NMC will have done what it had to do, as has been done in the past. Mm. And this reminds me of a story you published that led to your arrest on your way to visit your sister, right? Uh -huh. well, Tell me about it. <laughs> oh, you see, uh, when you are in, uh, in uh, journalism, their way of doing what Kuku Aku called Diabolis. So Sim you were a chief Daibo? <laughs> no, 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 I'm not. I'm not like him. I'm a, I'm a simple Marcanti. It was to do with the 31st. And you know, you know, it was 2000. And you know, in 31st December, they did a, a, the issue of March Pass to celebrate. And we wrote a story saying that this will be the last 31st. Okay. Because we are going to constitutional group. <laughs> and uh, the powers that be didn't like it. But why that headline? Eh? Why that headline? <laughs> well, say, we were trying to say that. This is, this is the last time. So you can <laughs> march throughout uh, the streets of Accra and even go to Elubu uh, uh, and uh, Aflau. You won't do it again because the constitution said that you cannot celebrate any, anything to do with the coup d'etat. So, so you, you can celebrate June 4th as a national event. So you were arrested because of that? Oh yeah, I was arrested. I was ambushed in the night on my way to uh, uh, Central Region. I went to visit a... Uh, your friend's uh, sister, mm, and then I was uh, his wish, mother. Uh, the mother, the mother, yes. you know, and the mother had to drive. He had just delivered uh, the last born, three months old. They won't allow me to drive. I was driving a Tico, you know, that the small car. But yeah. I, I drove faster than uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what's the name of the guy? <laughs> Formula One driver, the champion, <laughs> Hamilton. When we are in danger, you 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 become a Formula One driver. My goodness, you know, it's a long story. <laughs> What do you make of the young crop of journalists we have today? 
Are but, they meeting your expectations? Well, I, I believe that you know each uh, each um, period in history throws up new challenges, uh, and uh, in, in a large measure, those who want to succeed and be counted among the greats are doing well. You know, I think the Bible says that uh, when you sow, some will, will germinate, <laughs> some will be choked by by thorns, and uh, you know, so it, it's 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 a broad field. A lot are excelling, mm. but many are just passengers. Okay. So my advice is that don't be a passenger. Uh, write your own story, and you write your own story by being the best of of a, of a professional. And mm. so I see uh, great material all over all over there are challenges i mean i think that the economic in our time it was there but it is worse now because uh, there, there's a priority of media uh, there's uh, scarce advertising going around uh, so remuneration for media can be a a, a compromising factor but uh, in the midst of uh, plenty the food can be tasty mm -hmm. so in the in the midst of scarcity the food or the wise can be plentiful if that's the, the right mm. an analogy. Mm. So what I'm saying is that no matter the challenges of today, there are still windows of opportunity for people to excel and be counted. And already many people are being counted. I don't want to mention names. But those who want to succeed are making it. Hmm. Yeah. So apart from um, your nephew taking up journalism any of your children going well, into I, I journalism? well i have two daughters who are to, to journalism okay uh, uh, they, they, they 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 apply their trade outside and my son my first son uh did some journalism before he, he made another transition okay yeah okay so it's in the family and i hear there are a lot of amihias in journalism now and and bliss uh, <laughs> You know, so all I be here, I, I accept as my own, <laughs> even when it, it was, there's no blood link. But of course, you also became an ambassador to Cote d'Ivoire mm -hmm. and later became the High Commissioner to Sierra Leone. Yeah, it's the other way around, High Commissioner first. It's yeah. High Commissioner first too. Okay, so how was the experience? Well, you know, the transition to, from media to diplomacy is a thin line. And I think that in my life as a journalist and as, as an activist, I was doing some form of diplomacy. Mm. You know, diplomacy is talking to people, negotiating, representing interests. Uh, so when I was a, a journalist, I was representing the interests of journalists. But I became the, the envoy for Ghana, and you know, I represent Ghana. Uh, so it was, it was a, a smooth transition. Uh, when you move into any new uh, sphere, you, you learn. So I took time to learn. And uh, by the time I left, I had uh, learned a few of the ropes. Uh, so when I moved from Freetown to Abidjan, I think I, I was confident enough to approach my, my, my life as a diplomat in a French-speaking country with uh, some savvy and some uh, confidence. And, uh, I, I, I want to believe that in both Sierra Leone and then in Côte d'Ivoire, uh, we brighten the, the electric corner that God gave us to, to serve. Interesting. Let's talk about your passion because you were a board member of uh, the uh, uh, Kotoko, right? Yes, for six years. For six years. Mm -hmm. I mean, tell me about the passion. You, I mean, your football passion. You say you used to play it when you were in the university. Do you still play? No, I don't. I don't. But when, when I used to play for the mini eleven, and uh, I was called all kinds of names because of my dribbling uh, skills. I used to be called uh, Joe Debra, who was a great uh, Kotoko player. Oh, you used to dribble. And at the twilight of my media eleven days, I was called uh, Oponyia. Okay. Uh, except that I never scored a goal. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I like to offer asses when they say you soccer. Do I get the opportunity to play football with you? Well, anytime, anytime, you know. Uh, Age has caught up with all of us, but <laughs> I, I, I can still dribble. You know, I come from the Western region, <laughs> and ours is 2010, okay. so I don't just like scoring goals. Mm. I'm not a Mourinho type of uh, uh, football fanatic. Okay, which which position? I wherever mean, the ball you is, play? I don't play. I'll the, find you. No, wherever the you have to be at the ball so that you can get the ball and, and dribble. Mm. I don't play to a, a formation. Okay. 
I mean, you were just. No, no, I, 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 maybe wherever the boys, I'm, I'm a, a <laughs> utility player. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we went to uh, uh, Togo to play the the media eleven to okay. play the Togolese uh, a, a counterpart, and I played in both halves. I played for the Togolese and I played for the the Ghanaian uh, team, and it was live. Hmm. So when we get the boy, say pass, pass. I said, why should I pass? <laughs> There's a camera. <laughs> so if I spend at least 10, 20 seconds, I'll be captured. If I pass, they will capture me. <laughs> you know, so when I get a ball like Polo, I, I, I will tap it. And then you'll be and then dribbling. And you up before I move. <laughs> By that time, the camera had me on me for 30 seconds. <laughs> you know, so they will mention me. They will mention the one who scored the goal. But tell me also about the Simquedo dance those days in the Western region. Oh, well, you know. Uh, Ambly happens to be a friend. Okay. And uh, in the, I was in university when he started uh, uh, his music. And then by 74, when he, he did a single do, um, it was a hit. And, and uh, I became a businessman of a, businessman of a sort, m myself and my cousin Freddie. We actually promoted them to come and jam at Legon. Okay. You know, and it's a good beat. Mm. Uh, the dancing is great. You know, so. And if you are from the Western region and uh, you have to learn to second day, then you have to promote uh, the Western region through music and okay. through anything that is uh, about. Is it this to end? Aye. 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 You used to use your leg. Okay, I think I've seen him do it. Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, mm, mm, hey. 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 Sing a bit for me. Quagidos. Help them. Quagidos. Hey. Indeed. Hey. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Wow. Thank you so much, Ambassador Cabral Blay and me here for talking to us. We really, really appreciate your time. And thank you so much, viewers, for watching. And same time next week, we'll be bringing you another interesting personality on PM Personality Profile. My beautiful dress was made by Needle Thread Designs. Find them at uh, West Loop Tessano. You can call them on 543 one nine six four five one zero five four three one nine six four five one. My name is Aisha Brian. Many thanks for watching. Enjoy the rest of our programs.